Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to Science of the Solar System, New Approaches to Learning Online and on Campus. I, as you might realize, am not Mike Brown. My name is Cassandra Hori. I'm director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach here at Caltech. And if you happen to graduate before 2012 or so, you might not have heard of us. Uh, we are relatively new on campus, but we're focused on really working with the faculty, teaching assistants, staff, and others here on campus, both on the teaching we do here at Caltech and on K-12 educational outreach. When we're working on teaching, we're often trying to bring together the research on teaching and learning, what we think might work in general, with the teaching that we actually do here on campus with faculty and TAs. One example of this, as we learn more and more about how science education really works at the university level, is a recent meta-analysis. Thousands and thousands of students, hundreds of courses. And one of the things that comes out of this work more and more clearly is that active learning does a lot for our students. And here at Caltech, as we work with our faculty coming to division seminars, our annual teach week, various workshops and courses, people are getting more and more exposure to new thoughts, new ways of teaching. And in fact, here at Caltech, participation has been amazing. So just in the first three years of our center's operation, we've seen participation rates rise. And in fact, as we do here at Caltech, we are crushing our competition. So we're up to uh, two to four times the rates of participation scaled to institutional size. And that extends to the faculty. So over uh, two thirds of, of the faculty have participated in our programs and services across ranks from all the divisions and really more than half of them at in-depth and moderate depth levels. That means they're coming to more than one event or workshop, they're consulting with us. They're really engaged in thinking about how we teach here at Caltech and beyond. Just a few examples. So did anyone hear Professor Antonio Rangel speak earlier today from economics? A few of you did. He's been intensely thinking about how to teach economics, especially the intro Ec 11 course here. He happened to come to a talk um, by a visitor from University of Arizona who had really transformed teaching spaces at their campus, including some kind of pop-up active learning spaces. So with Antonio, we turned Avery Dining Hall into a collaborative learning space for a day using round tables and lap size whiteboards. And in fact, this made a big difference for students collaborating on problem sets and working through kind of challenging cases. 86% of the students in this class said it's important or very important for Caltech to have more permanent learning learning spaces like this. Many of our instructors, faculty, TAs, are thinking about the idea of flipped classes. You'll hear a lot more about this from Mike Brown today. The idea, though, is to have some first exposure to the content before coming to class so that when we're together in class, we can really work on the kind of depth of understanding and complexity that challenges our amazing students. So one of our applied physics professors had this idea, but wanted to do it in a very low-tech way. We worked with Brent Fultz on structuring some pre-class reading and questions that students might want to ask about it. And then he interspersed mini lectures with problem solving in class. The interesting thing was that despite covering less material in class that, some, that quarter, um, he said at the end, students did much better on the final exam this year. It was rather obvious, actually. And even our TAs are getting involved in improving assignments and other aspects of teaching. Jason Pollock, a physics graduate student, attended a workshop on improving how we write assignments, making them clearer to students, more transparent, more helpful for them as they pursue their careers. And he was inspired to redesign all eight assignments for Physics 20. Those will be implemented to the delight of the professor next year. So while it's not our focus today, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the work that we do with our K-12 institutions. We are delighted to be collaborating with the local Pasadena schools in new ways and really expanding opportunities for learners of all ages to explore science with us here at Caltech. 
So I hope this lends a little bit of context to Mike Brown's work with his massive open online course, Science of the Solar System and its on-campus counterpart. Mike will tell you more. Um, after his remarks, we'll have some time for Q&A. That Q&A will include both your questions and some that come in from our online audience today. We actually have students who are in Mike Brown's online course right now, uh, participating virtually. If you want to wave to them and say hello, they're out there in the ether, um, and they will also be asking some questions. So without further delay, let's welcome Mike Brown. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, it was a great introduction to, to, uh, to what the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach does. And it's been, I have to tell you, it's, it's been an amazing thing to have this on campus, which we never had for most of the 20 years that I've been here. And it really changes the way that people are, are thinking about uh, teaching and doing courses and learning. And it really totally changed the way I've taught all of my classes now for the past four years. And so I, I just wanted to tell you about the experience of going from sort of the generic stand in front of the class and deliver a lecture teacher to, I think, this much more interesting way of doing it. So I've, I was trying to figure out how to tell the story um, and what it is. And so here's title one. And as you can see, the, the, the picture is an obvious metaphor. I have no idea what it's a metaphor for, but it's clearly a metaphor. Um, <laughs> I was looking for a good slide to have as the, as the first picture, and, and I was, I don't know how I found this, but I was like, that's just a cool picture. I'm just going to use it. So I don't know what it is. It's dinosaurs eating turtles. Um, that probably means something. In fact, it might actually be related not to this one, uh, Contemplations and Unloads. So the other title, this one actually might actually make sense. It's uh, Help a MOOC Ate My Classroom, which is interesting because, of course, uh, the MOOC here is the dinosaur eating the turtle, which is still around. And I think that's actually relevant in some way that's not obvious. Um, so. First question is, how many of you are actually in the Science of the Solar System online class? Wow. Nice to have you all here. Um, so I actually wear glasses in real life. And I, and I have, I, I'm not wearing my blue shirt, I'm sorry to say. Um, and, I, and I didn't shave. Uh, so they've been watching all these lectures of, of, you have to do all these things when you're teaching, when you're, when you're doing these classes online. We'll talk about some of the technical details in a minute. For those of you who are not in this one, how many of the rest of you have taken any kind of online class? Good number. How many of you uh, know what, a, what the word MOOC stands for? That's not so bad. So how many of you remember the first time you ever heard the word MOOC? So when was it? Give me a year. Two years ago, five years ago? Five, six. Did anybody hear it 10 years ago? 10 years ago, we have a 10. Anybody more than 10? They used to use that on Law and Order to refer to bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> bad guys on Law and Order, apparent. Mook? Well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I, know, I believe that part, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go with it. So I, I was curious about when, when I first heard the word Mook. And I remember, the, so it, 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 we started talking about these on campus. Uh, I was trying to remember when it was, and I, I went back and looked. But we started talking about the same time that they were starting to take off in the world. So here is Google searches. This is like one of the fun things you can do to really waste your time in your, in your office. Go to the to trends.google.com and put in MOOC. How many, how, many, there it is. how many Google searches? Come on there, boy. Uh, September 1st, 20, there's a little, and then it just goes boom. So somewhere right around... Um, 2013 is, you know, there might have been a few people who were using the term way back in here 10 years ago, but not too many. So it really got to be a thing very quickly. In fact, um, you know, you would read headlines like this. Here's, here is, the date is up here, May 11th, 20, 2012, right there. Very early on, big idea that can revolutionize higher education, MOOC. It's kind of a stupid name, isn't it? Can they come up with a better one? I don't know. Okay, so let's keep going. Very quickly, the New York Times declared it the year of the MOOC. Look, we're not even, we're not even at peak MOOC yet, and we're already the year of the MOOC. Um, pretty exciting. What do we got up next? Uh, into the future. I like this one because this is great. The future is so clearly one of universal access to free, high-quality, impeccably branded online courses that their presence can be simply assumed. That is, I mean, if that's not like the kith, kiss of death when somebody writes that, I don't know what it is. Um, 
The MOOC explosion will accelerate the breakup of the college credit monopoly. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfectly reasonable point. The, if, if people can take an equivalent class online, why does it have to be colleges that give these college credits? It kind of makes no sense, which of course leads to, this is all, these are all right around September 2012, uh, a threat or opportunity to universities. And this is the stage when we were really starting to have these discussions here. We were having the same discussions. Should we jump into this idea of doing these MOOCs? Um, is it going to change everything about uh, all universities? Is it going to change is it going to change Caltech? Is it going to change different things? You can imagine that, that uh, the, the universities that are most threatened, that would feel the most threatened, colleges that were most threatened, might be more like a, a community college where you really could imagine that somebody could put a really good class online and they wouldn't need all those you know, adjunct faculty that they have teaching them. As we were talking about these things, we thought here at Caltech, we probably will never have the threat from external MOOCs because we have the, the, the participatory experience is so important here, but maybe we should be some of the people providing these things. Uh, very quickly, San Jose State University is replacing live lectures with video and it increases test scores. Um, they started, we, uh, Cassandra talked a little bit about flipping the classroom. They started having externally produced classes. I actually think this is a really good idea, externally produced classes and then the, the instructor would meet with the students to discuss the, the videos that everybody had watched. So you don't need, you know, you can get the, the world's expert in something talking about the stuff and then you guys can, can talk about it. And the, the professor or the TA functions more as a facilitator than having to be the expert. So this is the point at which I thought this is, this is pretty cool. So we're, we're about a half peak MOOC at this point. Um, and we had had these discussions on campus and, and I decided, this, it just sounds, it sounds interesting. I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm, easily, uh, I'm easily bored by whatever I'm doing. And so I was, you know, bored teaching whatever I was teaching. I'm like, I wanna teach something new. I wanna do something crazy. I wanna do this MOOC thing. And so I, I signed up. This was about, uh, this was probably April of 2013. Um, I signed up because, well, they, they were related. I was also starting to teach a new course again that I hadn't taught in, in about a decade, which was, in, on campus, it's called Introduction to the Solar System. It's the, it's the sophomore level end of the geology sequence. So if you're, if you're in GPS as a sophomore, you take uh, Introduction to Geology, Introduction to Geophysics, um, Introduction to Geochemistry, and Introduction to Planetary Science. So it was, it was a, just the, that typical part of the sequence. But it was also one that I knew you could teach as an online class and people would be interested. The other class that I was teaching at the time, still teaching at the time, is a, is a physics for earth scientists, no interest online. Nobody cares about that. But introduction to the solar system seemed pretty good. So I thought, I'm gonna sign up to do this. It sounds really cool. Uh, MOOCs are gonna be great. They're gonna change the world. Everybody loves MOOCs. Um, and about a, uh, two weeks later, these started to appear. Uh, San Jose State won't use Harvard professor's MOOC. Uh, keep your MOOC off our campus. Fan, faculty push back against edX. Um, the inevitable backlash from the previous slide where they had all been excited to, to teach somebody else's class was, you know, you can see how what happens. You don't quite need as many of those faculty. And, you know, the faculty figure that out pretty quickly and they decide that they're not going to do this anymore. So this is, there's a lot of mentions of MOOC right here on this particular month, but it's because it's all bad at that point. MOOCs, MOOCs are potentially terrible and who knows what. Um, but there were, people were still riding the big MOOC train and you know that things have really hit the big time right here on the first peak when the Wall Street Journal is talking about the business models. Um, so people have now decided that they think they can make money off this. Universities think they can make money off this. Um, you know, some of them think they're gonna get rich, some of them think they're gonna uh, go out of business. Maybe that's what the dinosaurs eating the turtles are or something. Still not sure about that one. Um, but it was, a, it was a really uncertain time uh, to, to be starting doing this, but it just seemed like um, a great time to do it. So this is, this is at the peak. This is in the month before I started filming for my, my class. Uh, these all started appearing. MOOCs are going to help open career doors. I actually noticed that all of these are ones with the question mark at the end because no one knows anything. Uh, will MOOCs kill university degrees? Are MOOCs really a failure? So this is the, uh, the inevitable backlash. Um, shut up about MOOCs already. I'll 
my favorite one. We didn't do it. And then, actually, this one is good and, and worth just actually spending a t little bit of time reading. Uh, the Intrigue of Coursera. The, the, he was talking about why MOOCs are terrible, 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 terrible. And it's not because the idea is terrible. It's because faculty are terrible at teaching everything. And so teaching a MOOC doesn't magically make them better. And it's I'm not sure they're bad at everything. But it's, uh, the, it is actually true um, that the reason the top universities do not offer the best teaching and learning experiences uh, they do research, blah, blah, blah. Putting these courses online often makes them worse. Um, it is absolutely true. If anyone has, have ever, has ever gone and sort of perused uh, any of the big online providers, um, Coursera and edX are the big ones these days, probably a few more that have sprung up, uh, and you go sign up for any random classes, I would say that the majority of them are terrible. I mean, just poorly produced, poorly thought out, uh, a waste of your time, um, and in probably the real life version of the class is, is the same way. So I actually think this, this, guy was, this guy was onto something. So armed with all that, at this moment, this is the moment, um, this was the big peak, this is the moment where I, I started producing, started thinking about my MOOC that I was gonna teach in the spring of 20, 2014. Yeah, so this is right, right before 2014. I hit it, apparently, right at the, when, when MOOCs hit steady state. They're not steady state. I was like, you know, being a dorky scientist kind of person, I started looking at this pattern. You notice it's actually really quite periodic. Big dip, and then a, a, and then a quick dip, and then big dip, quick dip, big dip, quick dip. Anybody guess what the big dips are? Um, uh, so not Christmas. Uh, Christmas is the little dip. People do not do it right over Christmas, but then they have time. These are just summertime. It's July, August. So it's interesting because um, we, had, we had talked about when are the right times to start MOOCs? When should, if we want to attract an audience, when should we do it? And I never thought to look here, but here's the answer. You do it as with you know, starting your, uh, your gym membership, you do it right after New Year's. It starts right, right about, <laughs> it'll, it's like I'm gonna, my resolution is to learn me some planetary science. Um, so, so this is the point where I, I now, I knew I was going to do this, um, and I had to really wrap my head around what, what the heck it is. Uh, so first off, you know, you have to think about things like, what is the title? Introduction to Planetary Science doesn't actually give the right flavor, because I wanted to teach a class that was, I, I wanted, it was it's the Caltech class. I wanted to do this flipped classroom where I used the, 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 the videos that I was gonna produce online and, let, and have that be also what the Caltech students watch. So that, uh, that automatically uh, turns it, it's a different class than kind of your you know, generic rocks for jocks or, or uh, satellites for, I don't know, I, I don't, there's no generic planetary one. Uh, Jupiter for, for I, don't, I can't even think of the right words. Come on, someone give me one. Uh, Jupiter for juveniles, Pluto for peons, you know, that kind of class. Um, Mar Mars for morons. I don't know why I couldn't come up with those. So <laughs> that is a good one. Solar system for silly, I don't know. So anyway, so I didn't want it to just be that class. It was going to be a real class. So this is so the first decision was to, 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 to brand it basically as, as a real Caltech class, um, science of the solar system. So I really wanted to have that science word in there to scare people off a little bit if they were going to be scared off. I didn't want people coming in thinking that they were going to get the Mars for morons and, and, uh, and not do anything. And then I had to think about, just like with any other new class, you think about a syllabus. I taught this class 10 years earlier, and uh, I think my syllabus, was it, was it this one? It might have been something like this. Uh, now, I think it's more like the second one. This is, this is the way, you know, you, you can, I went and looked online yesterday to see how many other people teach a class kind of like this. And it's basically, you know, talk about Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Talk about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Talk about comets. Talk about the formation of everything. Uh, brief mention of life in the universe. Give them a final go home. Um, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't like that style. So when, and when I taught it, I actually did a little bit more, uh, tried to make it more topical than just like planet by planet by planet, form the solar system, talk about its surfaces, its interiors, atmospheres, exoplanets. This actually uh, is the same as our graduate sequence for a planetary scientist. The, the one thing I would say about both of these syllabi is uh, that they're really, really boring. I mean, <laughs> that is just, 
as tedious as you could be. And as long as you're blowing up everything and starting over again, why not make it a little bit less boring? So I thought about, instead of um, going from topic to topic in what one might think of as a logical order, the weird thing, the interesting thing, the fun thing about the solar system and learning about the solar system is that really to understand any part of the solar system, any body in the solar system, any process in the solar system, you really have to pull in from all over the place. You have to pull in physics that here at Caltech, everybody's taken the physics classes, so they, they can pull in the physics. You pull in the chemistry, the biology, um, things, things that you've learned all over. And so rather than just going one by one, I decided to try this crazy experiment where we would instead ask questions. So the question one, in this, that's, each of these questions is about a quarter of the class. Question one is just to answer this one question. Where is the water on Mars? Uh, you heard a little bit about that. Was anyone here in the last session? So you guys know where the water on Mars is. Is it up at the North Pole in that ocean basin? Nah, it's not there anymore. Um, to answer the question on where the water is on Mars, though, I mean, you, you can't just say, you know, it's, it's right there. You have, to, you have to talk about all of these things about planets. You have to understand the atmosphere and how the atmosphere holds water. You have to understand what the geological record is, which tells you where the water is. Um, the interior and the magnetic fields, which is maybe one of the reasons why there's not water left anymore, because magnetic fields shut down and, and the atmosphere is no longer protected from the solar wind, <laughs> greenhouse effects, volatile transport, the missions, orbital mechanics to understand how we get there. You, you, you have to cover all of these different topics in planetary science just to answer that one question. And it's a much more interesting way of covering these topics than to say, now we're going to talk about the greenhouse effect on all the different planets. You really care about these different answers. So that was good. So I was trying to think of now, how do I get everything? So the next question that we decided to go for is what's inside of a giant planet? And to do insides of giant planets, <coughs> You got all kinds of stuff. You have to talk about uh, quantum mechanics of, of, of high compressed gases and, and convection heat transport, hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, formations of cores, current missions like Juno. So you have to cover all these different things. You're starting to get pretty good. You're covering a lot of planetary science. I'm a big fan of the small bodies in the solar system, um, which is what I mostly spend my time working on. And so I was gonna spend a lot of time talking about them no matter what but I wanted to get people to understand why people spend time on these small bodies. Um, it's because you can use these small bodies as tracers of the rest of the solar system and learn about how the solar system works by these smallest bodies because you have to talk about all these things, forming them, meteorites, isotopic dating, uh, Kuiper belt, some big, uh, Planet Nine, big fan of that one. Um, and finally, we've covered a lot of stuff, but then the, 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 the one that many people get excited about is you know, where should we look for life outside of the Earth? And this is a very specifically phrased question. I'm not talking about is there life? I'm not really talking about life nearly as much, but I'm asking where we should look because we don't, we don't really know much about life in the solar system or beyond, but we know places that are interesting to look and we can talk about them. And in some ways, this whole section is bait and switch because really it's an excuse to talk about Europa and talk about Titan and talk about Enceladus and how life on Earth started and, and, and how life on Earth is powered. So you get to talk about these very concrete things, um, but then bring them into the planets in the solar system and then think about life beyond the solar system too. And what's fun and great about this is that these, where'd they go? There they are. These, these four topics, I mean, that covers everything. This is, this is the solar system. If you wanted to learn about the science of the solar system, uh, I don't think that there's very much in here that, that we miss. Um, we might touch on it just a little bit on all of them, but we, we cover every bit of it. So, so I got a syllabus. I have a syllabus, I have a title. Um, now it's a MOOC, right? So the, the, the fact that it's a MOOC, oh no, the fact that it's a MOOC meant I didn't put my, you have my slide, but I don't have my slide. I, I put a new slide in and it's on the wrong computer, so you don't get to see it. Um, I, had, I took a picture of where I produced these videos. So you have to have all these videos to put online, and so I, I had a picture that you can't see of my very sophisticated studio, which is me sitting at my desk in my office um, with a webcam pointing at my face and a, a large tablet um, that I can write on uh, that's, that's actually just the third monitor of my computer, so I can write on it here and move stuff around here, and a, and a clip-on mic, sort of like this. And, and that's it, and then a green screen behind me. Um, and so, 
I, I decided to do it that way after watching. I, I spent a lot of time looking at all these other MOOCs and finding ones that were I thought were compelling versus not compelling. There's some really, the ones that were the, the, the least compelling were ones where uh, no human appears. It's just PowerPoint slides with a droning voice behind it. Those are pretty bad. Uh, it's hard to stay interested. Slightly more compelling where, where, where there are PowerPoint slides and maybe like a video of, of somebody standing up and lecturing as you can see the person doing and kind of engaging. Those are okay, but I saw one or two that I really liked where it's very clean look, where there's a white screen, almost like a whiteboard, and the person is writing on the white screen, and the person's face is in there engaging you. And I just, I found that that was just uh, a much easier way to stay engaged in what the class is. So I, so, I did it that way. So that meant I had to green screen myself. I put a green screen behind me and filmed all this and then put my head into the, the frame that was the, the, uh, the, the notebook that I was going on. So I'll show you what some of these look like. I can't show you the picture of, of where it is, but here's, oh, here's, so here's what they look like. So here is uh, what the course now looked like as I started going online. Here's the second week, uh, week two, water on Mars, um, skills taught in the module, none. Apparently, I teach no skills. Um, water Mars, then each one of these is a lecture. Here's 15 minutes, 15 minutes, nine minutes. Each one is a small block that you can watch um, pretty quickly, or you can you know, do like Netflix. You can set it up on auto start and, and go through. You can, uh, you can binge watch all of these things. I think this one's a video. Is this a video? Go video. OK, so here we are. Let's, let's go down and see what goes on here. Here's more of these. Uh, I think I'm going to click on one of them. Let's watch. I want to watch this one. Let's go watch this one. Yeah, good. Okay. Click on this one. And so here I am. I'm, I, I am sitting in my office. Green screen is behind me. So I'm actually, li th this part, oh, there I go. And then the, the nice thing that you can do, uh, doing it on video instead of in class. I mean, there's some things that you can do better on this than, than you can do in class. I can show people, here I am actually drawing on it. Uh, this is uh, Eberswaldi Delta in the, in the crater. I think, oh, and you can speed it up if you decide that it's too boring at that speed. You can put on subtitles. You can draw all over the place. It turns out I learned something yesterday when I quick put this into my presentation, which is this lecture has subtitles of the previous lecture. So if you look what I'm saying, it is not related to what I'm doing at all. It's like, <laughs> I, I didn't know that until yesterday. No one complained. I guess no one uses subtitles. Actually, so so the, the subtitles, the subtitles turn out to be uh, extremely valuable. I didn't think, I actually didn't like the idea of subtitles at first because I often feel people read instead of paying attention. Um, so I kind of tried not to have them. And then I was told by some of the people in my first version of the class is that they are immensely valuable for non-native non English speakers. Um, and they, this, the class is being taken all over the world. And so uh, people in India and China, for example, love the, the subtitles. They were probably really confused by what the heck was going on on this one right here. So, so uh, but it's, I, I like the look. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the look. I think it looks pretty good. Um, there's the blue shirt. I wear the same blue shirt. I shave every time. And I don't wear glasses. You can't wear glasses because um, I, my office has a big window in, in that I'm facing, which the lighting is good for doing green screening. But my glasses reflect um, trees outside my window. And it's, it's true, I mean, it's things you learn. When you try to green screen yourself wearing glasses and there's trees outside, you, your eyes go all sparkly like a zombie or something. And so that looks weird. So I had no green screen for that. Also, a uh, nice blue shirt is good to green screen. I couldn't wear this shirt. Um, this, this shirt would, you know, some of it would green screen out and I would look like I was semi-transparent or something weird. So wear the same shirt all the time uh, and don't wear glasses and, and for a while, for continuity, I decided to keep myself uh, clean shaven the whole time. I finally gave up. Uh, it's too hard to do. Um, so, so there are something like, I think, 90 little 10 to 15 minute lectures that look like this. Uh, each one has, this one I, did, I forgot to show this, but uh, as Cassandra talked about the active learning at the beginning, each one has an opportunity to stop and reflect and answer some questions to get a little bit of active learning. It's still not the same as sitting in a lecture with a professor where you can stop and raise your hand. People sometimes complain about this, but it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a great way to deliver these lectures to a large number of people. Okay, so now you've had the lectures, but it's a class, right? So you need to figure out what you're actually going to uh, do with this class. So, okay, here's what I wanted to show you. 
the quizzes. So there are quizzes. At the end of every week, there's a quiz. Uh, because it's a class, you can do well or not do well. And the problem is, or the, the, the good or bad news is, you know, there are, if you're going to do a class online, you're not going to grade online people's stuff. It's just not possible. So you need something that's computer gradable. And there are combinations of multiple choice. Uh, some of them are short answer. Some of them are put things in order. I was pretty un... Uh, <laughs> no. I was just to see if anyone's paying attention. Um, so then you, 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 finish your, you finish your quiz, and you check to see how you did, and I didn't do very well. Uh, I don't see what my actual grade is, but, I can, but you can take it three times a day. You, can, you have to get 80% to go on. You know, there, there are people who really want it to be super hard and, and they want it to be 100% and you can only take it once. And that would be great, except the point here is for, for the external audience is to get people to learn. So people are learning by seeing what they did wrong, rethinking about it, taking it over again, learning what they did right, uh, which is a much better way of doing it. The, the, it's not, though, what you would do for a real class on campus. You're not going to give your, your on-campus students, you know, a weekly true-false quiz to, to see what's going on. Um, I would say that I have learned to do better multiple choice quizzes than I, than I thought were possible. Be, uh, some of the students hate them sometimes, but they're, it, the, the more convoluted you make your questions, the more interesting the, the answers are. So I'll often do a, one of, the, one of the following statements is not true, which one? And that's a lot more interesting than which one is true. Because you can always scan one and find the one that's true if you even know a little bit. Finding the one that's not true means you have to read each one, think about each one, and everything you're reading with one exception is actually true, so you're remembering things that are actually true as opposed to reading these things that are not true. Um, so I, so I, I really like these questions. They're not as bad as, as I would think with multiple choice, but they're still multiple choice questions. But that's the way the online class works. So, that's kind of the, the, the way the online class looks. So I, I, I barely had it ready in time for the start, the spring quarter, um, 2013, 14, when we first started. Um, I showed up that first day. You know, the people watch all the, the videos ahead of time. And I was thinking, wow, this is going to be easy now because they, you know, I don't even have to do any work anymore. I've already recorded everything. And I got there and I realized I had no idea what I was going to do during class. Um, I mean, it wasn't quite as bad as I had no idea, but that, that Suddenly, I'm, I'm used to lecturing. I can fill a class for an hour and a half lecture, a uh, little bit of a discussion. We can keep it going. But if really they've already seen all that, you, you have to spend a lot more time suddenly re thinking about what you're doing. And in, in many ways, I find it harder to prepare for classroom time now than I did when it was just a simple lecture. Um, because you're trying to make it, you're trying to get the students involved in some sort of activity where they'll learn something. So here's, uh, Cassandra took some pictures just from Thursday class. So sometimes in a class, I will stand up here on the board and, and draw pictures, particularly if I'm drawing pictures. Guess, guess what I'm drawing pictures of? Yeah, and at Planet Nine, there it is. Um, so I'm, talk, I'm, I'm setting up a problem that they're all gonna work on. And so, so I'll often do that, I'll set up a problem and then what works really well is to get them all, to get them into little groups. You saw that picture of Antonio's class working in, in, uh, uh, in, on these little tables. We have this classroom set up pretty well. So they, they segregate into little groups of maybe three. Uh, there's Alex Dessler, class of 52, uh, came to visit the class, helping out these students. Um, there's a TA who's asleep. Uh, <laughs> she, she was feeling sick that day, it's okay. Um, but so they're all working on a particular problem that, that, I, that I'll, maybe I'll, I'll make you guys work on here in, in the end if we have time. Um, and also, as Cassandra said, the, the, the setting up the classroom is important. We didn't work, use it today. And I wish I had, I, I never thought to take pictures during class to show, you, show people all the different ways we work, but it's actually would be good. Because notice that this classroom, I'm, I'm over here. The front of the classroom is over here. You can see which way everybody's sitting. But there are whiteboards on this wall and there are whiteboards on the wall over here also. And I, I had all those put into this classroom so that when we're working on something, they didn't do it this time, but often um, everybody will stand up on, on the board and start working on the whiteboard on their own little patch of whiteboard. And that's good for a couple reasons. One is that it, 
It makes them talk more when they're, when they're working and standing up and, and writing things down together. But it also means I can see everything going on. So I, I see what every group is working on. And when somebody is stuck, either I will go over and talk to them or one of the TAs can go over and talk to them. And so if, if they're just sitting here like this, this one was a quick one, so they didn't go anywhere. Um, you don't know what's going on. But it's, it is, I have to say, even though I didn't know what I was doing, I really, really didn't know what I was doing that first year. Uh, nobody in here has taken my class in person, right? No, no in-person class people. If there were, I was gonna apologize for anybody that first year. It was, it was, it was rough going. I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with that class. It's a totally new thing that, uh, that we, didn't, we didn't really know much about. Uh, it was immensely helpful to have the Center for Teaching and Learning and Outreach to, to go to, to talk about how you, how you arrange these things. It helped a lot, but it, uh, it's still, it's a, it's a big learning experience. Four years in, um, I think it's pretty good, actually. Most of the time, uh, we, you know, we are, I, I consider a good class one where it's loud, where students are talking, where we're working together on something. Um, this class this year is less loud because it's nine in the morning. Students hate nine in the morning classes, and so I, I've, been, I've been struggling to get them to actually come and be awake. Uh, but they have to, the, another interesting thing is they have to come. It's, this is, the, as, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, attendance at classes is not always part of the culture here at Caltech. Um, <laughs> and the classes aren't optional. The, this, is, this is where the learning takes place. They can watch the videos, and then they have to come to the classes. And they're, it, you know, if you tell them that, they're perfectly fine with it. Um, but they have to come to classes. The other thing they have to do is they have to watch the videos. Uh, if, if they just came to the classes and didn't watch the videos, uh, it wouldn't be much good either, because they wouldn't know what we're talking about. The videos, the, all, the class videos, they have to watch the stuff on the Coursera. Uh, the the, the in-person class has to watch those, and they have to watch them first. If they don't watch them, we don't have anything to talk about. So I tell them that, and then I also ask them, tell them that this is exactly what every professor has always said, which is that you have to read your reading assignment before you come to class. How many people ever read their reading assignments before they came to class? <laughs> A few of you did. I never did. I mean, I, I understand, I like, Maybe I did once or twice, but, uh, uh, but You're a really smart guy. I'm, a, I'm a really smart guy, so I didn't need to. No, that, I'm, I, I, I really needed to. It would have been, would have been quite useful. Um, so the culture, again, is that you don't do these things ahead of time. So I do have a, a very slight stick where the students, they don't take the same quiz as you saw online, but they have a different version of it where they just have to take a really simple quiz that tells me whether they watch the videos or not. If they've watched them, it's easy. If they haven't watched them, it's really hard. And, uh, The, so the class, the, the quiz, they have to do before the Tuesday class, and, and I can see what their scores were, and I can see who did it and who didn't. Um, and uh, the one thing I can't see, I, I can't see who's watched the videos and who hasn't, but I tell them that I can. <laughs> don't, don't tell them otherwise. I do, I say, I say and, and, and so every once in a while I'll come and I say, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to see most of you are watching the videos, but I know a few of you don't watch them quite as consistently as you should, and they believe me. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you a little bit about statistics. Um, to date, in the online, the real class, we've had 80 students, um, 70 have completed the class, and I, the nice thing is that you can then do studies to show how much more they've learned, and I have no idea. Um, I didn't teach this class before. I don't really know... I, my, my gut feeling is that this is a much more engaging, interesting way to teach it and that the students are really happy about it. Um, but, but I'm sad that we, didn't, we haven't really closed the loop. The loop should be that you do this as an experiment. You know, we're scientists. We should, do, we should teach, treat teaching as a big experiment. And I certainly teach my daily in-class stuff as an experiment. I'll try something and it's terrible. You know, and I know not to try this next year or next time. Um, but I didn't do this as an experiment. I don't really know how to do it as an experiment, and I wish I, wish I did, because I would like to know if all this effort has really been worth it and the kids are getting it, but I think they are. Um, I do think that they're, they're getting more out of it than they did before. But the, the online statistics now, again, the class, the class was really for the in-person students, and then as a, as a side bonus, it gets to be online, but the online statistics are pretty crazy. Um, so 65,000 have enrolled at some point, which just probably means that they just clicked, yes, I want to take it. Doesn't mean they ever have to do anything again. Uh, but but 25,000 have participated. It means they've watched videos. 
talked on the discussion board, um, done a quiz, done something. Uh, I think 5,000-ish have watched through the entire thing. And 1,600 have done enough to earn the certificate, which means you, these days it means you have to pay money. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it, in the past, you didn't have to pay money, so more did it in the past. Uh, currently, fewer do. This is more students, even this 1,600 is more than I'll ever teach at Caltech in my entire life. Uh, so this is a pretty amazing thing to me, personally, and pretty, a pretty gratifying thing. And as you guys know who are taking it, it is not a, uh, a small commitment to sit through and, and take this whole thing. So 1,600 people or 5,000 who have done it. Sometimes people who say that these MOOCs are not very good look at the 65,000 and say, well, only 5,000 completed it. I don't, I don't care how many people started it. I care about the people who've completed it, and 5,000 is an absurdly large number of people who, are now, who sat down and really learned in detail about science of the solar system. So I, I have really enjoyed this, this experiment. Um, interesting question to ask is, is what next? Uh, is it going to destroy the university? Um, is it going to change the way we do everything? I don't, I don't know the answers to any of these yes. It's not gonna destroy universities. It may really disrupt um, the way smaller places, um, community colleges maybe do it. I hope that it changes the way we teach. I hope we continue to experiment in these ways that we teach. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes in the future. So uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work to put one of these together. So it's not like I'm, I'm itching to go do a new one. Even keeping this one up to date, the solar system is tough. People keep discovering things, very irritating. Um, <laughs> if, you know, if teaching classical mechanics might be smarter, you can just do it once and, and hope that nobody discovers a new classical mechanics. You're probably better. But I, I'm still pretty excited about this. Uh, more people are generally working with the Center for Teaching and Learning Outreach, learning how to do these things where they flip the classroom. Regardless of whether I spend the effort to do these huge online stuff, again, I can't imagine ever going back to teaching a classroom where I lecture and then everybody takes notes and, and does problem sets. It just seems like a not very interesting way to do classes anymore. Um, so I think rather than, I, I had some slides where I was gonna do a little bit of a mini, mini version of one of my classes, but I actually, I forgot to look what time it is. Someone tell me what time it is. It's, um, quarter of. I, I think I'll stop, and I'll just uh, take some time for questions instead. That seems like a better idea. So let me. If, if, you, can use the, right if you can use the microphone, then our online audience will also be oh, able we have to a microphone. hear the or question. Yeah, there's a microphone mind. right there. Otherwise, if you're too far away, me. I'll repeat your question anyway, so they'll all hear it. Yeah, so our online audience is here somewhere. Hi, online audience. So how many emails do you receive per day with questions on your class? How many emails do I receive, receive a day with questions from my class? The answer is close to zero. Um, so it's, the, there is a, there, there's a discussion board so people can go and, and uh, ask questions on the discussion board, often answered by other students. There's, a, there's a, some TAs that will uh, look around the, the discussion board for things going on. I occasionally get direct email. I mean, my email address is really easy to find, so it's not like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very hidden person. Um, but people don't, people are respectful of the, the class boundaries for the, for the most part. Um, so it, 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 the only thing that takes time of the online version while it's running is just, it's, it's just always running in the back of my mind that this is happening. And I need, I, I just go in and check every once in a while, look at the discussion, see what's happening answer a few questions, um, but it mostly runs itself, mostly. Do you have any online ones we want to do real quick, or should I? How about go ahead one more okay. here. Okay. I was here in the early 70s. Um, what I found, a lot of the classes did not have textbooks, and you go to the lectures, and you're having you're having to make a decision. I'll, I want to really pay attention. At the other hand, I'm trying to scribble down notes and right. scribble down everything. And there's like, uh, I, you know, equations and chemical reactions and things like that. What I think would have really been good is if I could later on, after going to the lecture, have reviewed a replay of the class, and then I could have really absorbed everything like 100%. So that, how, that happens a lot these days, right? Uh, the, the, the lectures themselves are videotaped, and you can actually 
Occasionally, so actually one of our student groups, the Academics and Research Committee, part of Ask It, has a program where they, um, they also, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you twice. I'm trying oh, to figure okay. I think it's, Maybe it's just worse me. up here. Um, where they will get requests from other students for which courses they'd like to have video recorded, and then they make them available on campus. Yeah, so, I realized when I was here is like 45 years ago, so. They you carved know. it in stone tablets, I think. At the <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I'm saying this. I, I'm, that would have been Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can I ask a question from yes. online? So Jerry Ash is curious about the, um, actually some Mars stuff, if you're willing. Sure. 1976 Viking mission to Mars did various experiments to detect life. The initial conclusion was that at least one experiment detected life, but that conclusion was later reversed. Uh, and then the results are still inconclusive. Any opinion about the results of the Viking experiments? To so, detect so life? this is we've had uh, another of these sessions where um, we just had a chat session with the with the Caltech cohort that we're all taking the class right now, uh, and they just asked questions. So this is sort of the the discussions we had in these. So any of you who are taking the class or anybody else. Uh, if, if, you, if you ever see the announcement of these, they're pretty fun. So the question's like this. So, the, so the, it, I'm sure many of you remember that, uh, that Viking lander experiment where they, uh, let's see if I can remember exactly what they did. They dug up some soil. Um, they, they put some sort of, like, they put water on it. They put probably some sort of growth medium on it just to see if it, if it would, if there were, you know, if there were microbes in it, it would have grown, it would have respired. And uh, they basically found that, that um, they first thought something had happened, then they thought something hadn't happened, and so the question was, what do, what do I think? I think that right now it's, it's inconclusive because we now know more about the soils on Mars. We now realize that that experiment would not have detected life even if life had been there because of the way it was, because we didn't know about the soils at the time. Um, so this is exactly, so those of you who are in the, the previous session on Mars 2020, these are the sorts of experiments that are exactly gonna be the ones, uh, not exactly, but you know, similar sorts of stuff, better designed with our modern knowledge to, uh, to really answer these questions. So, you know, we will actually get a chance to see if there are, if, it, it'll, be, it'll be hard to know what the real answer is gonna be, but we'll get to see if, if these experiments are positive or negative. I can't, can't wait. Let's see, I'm gonna go here. Uh, yes, I was curious, I, I believe I saw that where the, there was some statistics suggesting that core scores were improved by having this external uh, video input yeah. uh, before. And I'm just curious, I mean, I was one of those geeks who actually read my book before class. <laughs> and um, I was just wondering whether or not by making the prepar preparatory material more interesting or more accessible, that is what gives you better scores, whereas the books themselves were simply not so interesting and people didn't, didn't actually do so much preparation. And that's what makes for the difference in the test scores. I, you know, I think that's a really interesting point. And I, I, I think of, these lectures that I've now recorded as almost like a, a, a textbook um, in, the, in that same sense, but one that actually can be modified year to year to year instead of having to wait for some publisher. Uh, because I, I do think it's that same way. It's just a, a more accessible way of, of watching this. But there is one other thing. It's not just that the preparatory stuff is, is more interesting and so you do it. I think the stuff we do in the classroom uh, is, is an incredible added value. I think the, that, that working through problems, um, working through, we did, uh, on Tuesday, we, we, uh, we went through the idea of how you use um, lead isotopes to figure out the age of the Earth that uh, Claire Pat Patterson famously did here on campus uh, many years ago. And everybody had seen the lecture and, and knew how it worked. But as they had sat down with the data and they made the plots and, and the TAs were there working with them on it, I think everybody learned how these things work more. So I think it's both of those things. I had one other quick question. Okay. And I realize the course is uh, over now. Unfortunately, I was out of town during the period. I'm wondering, can one still begin and complete the course it, online? It runs, currently it runs four times a year. Um, okay. So the next run is about July 1st, is that right? Yeah, somewhere around there. So if you go to Coursera.org, you can find your way in and yeah. join along. And I didn't mention the thing that I do want to mention. It was free for us at uh, Caltech is what I remembered. It's, it's free for everybody. Um, and I forgot it? to mention this part, and this is really important to me. So Coursera would love for it not to be free. Um, they will give you every opportunity that they can for you to give them money. Um, and I, uh, so you can also, if you're teaching a class like this, you can take part, you can, they, they call the, the part that you can get to for free the preview, and then you can put other parts behind a paywall. Um, 
my entire class is a preview and there's nothing behind a paywall. Because the, the whole point of this for me is that I, I want people to be able to take it in. So I, I, you, you might not have seen the statistics on where people have taken the class. They've taken it, I've so far never had anybody from Antarctica take it. But every other continent, um, people have been taking the class. And I get, you know, the emails that I do get, I get emails from people in, India who say, you know, the, our country is now doing, has a space program and there's no place I can take a class on the solar system. Thank you for having this online. Thank you for having it for free. So it is really important to me that it stays, stays free there. So I'm glad that, so if you ever sign up and they try to get you to sign up for a certificate, ignore it. You don't need to. Yeah. Yes. Um, from a production point of view, we talk about hours per minute of product. How, yeah, how, yeah. Many, how many hours per minute of video do you put in for production, all factors from writing, acting, and post-production yeah. to delivery? I would say it's, my feeling is that the number of hours per minute is all of them. Um, that, that, was, that was about how it felt at the time. Um, I would say one of those 15-minute segments um, would take me a day of work. So it's, eight, eight, so it's a half yeah. an hour per minute in that. Yeah, in that and you know, a day probably I had other things going on too. So maybe it would be like four or five hours. Okay, and how much, as a follow-up on that, and you mentioned it briefly in your talk, having put that capital investment of your time into producing that, how yeah. much is that inertia preventing you from updating it? <laughs> Have you, have, you, have you watched, looked at the class? It's, <laughs> there, there's some parts that I really don't like to update because it's a... It, no, it's very hard. I understand that. It's I'm, a big... This is something I learned um, only after I did the recording is never mention things like the year or what's going on. I'm like, oh. So I tried to go back and, and uh, edit all those out. But it's... It, I did this year for the first time. This is the fourth year in a row it's been going. This is the first year that I really put back up the green screen and actually re-recorded stuff. This is why you can see lectures with me, you know, actually didn't shave this year. Um, but I had, I had to do Planet Nine. I had to do New Horizons at Pluto. I had to do, had to do uh, um, Dawn at Ceres. I couldn't not have these things in there. But it's a, it's a lot of inertia. So, for example, um, the Juno spacecraft apparently is going to release data next week. Next week. Um, and... Uh, like, I, um, part of me is excited and part of me is like, God, damn, I to, <laughs> can't you wait? Uh, but so it's, it's, it's a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. You kind of asked the question I was going to ask as somebody who's interested in teaching, but I was also curious about the examples or the things that you actually do in class with the students at Caltech. Can you give other examples of kind of the technical problems that you Yeah, so, so we, we try to do a lot of different things, so it seems different every day. So on the, on the unit on Mars, for example, um, oh, and the, I f also didn't mention that the, the Caltech students have a, a real homework set that they do um, e each week, too. They don't just take these silly quizzes. They do a real quantitative homework set. Or sometimes they do writing. So one of the, the um, by about the second week of Mars, third week of Mars, they had to write uh, just a, just a one-page paper on what they thought the best landing site on Mars was for, for understanding the history of water. So they wrote this one-page paper, and I gave them, I gave them a choice of examples. Uh, and then in class that next day, I took all those papers, and, and it, they naturally divided into groups. And so we made groups of about three, and each one was then needed to, was going to make a presentation for the next class on you know, proposing to go to this particular site. So they worked together in class on their proposals and asked questions. And then the next class, they actually presented. They had, there were five groups, each gave a 15-minute a talk. Um, and I declared a winner and gave them a billion dollars to go land there. And then I canceled their mission so they didn't get any money. Um, so, we, so we've done that. Sometimes we do uh, just a, a worksheet. You know, I, I hand them a sheet with a, a series of problems and I say, go and they spend maybe 15, 20 minutes working individually, and then they will stop and uh, talk, to, talk in pairs and, and check and see who's got the right answer, and then they'll start to go around. Uh, on Tuesday, we're gonna start to talk about life, and we're gonna start with a discussion on what, what is life. Have everybody write down their own definition of life, and then we'll do the same thing, break into groups and critique everyone's definition and see if we can come up with a consensus best definition of life. So it's, it's different. Um, every time, and some of them, some of them work better than others. I've learned, and so I'm still trying to find the good ones. But it's, but it's all these different sorts of things we we do. Thursday, we uh, 
I showed him what I didn't get to show you guys, which is all those Kuiper Belt objects all swept off in one direction and that all say that there's Planet Nine, and I asked him to do the statistics. How do you know it's statistically relevant and not just a, a fluke? So we talk, you know, about all these different things. It sounds like it's a mix of uh, individual work and group work, and you do two classes a week? Two classes a week, right? yeah. Okay. And then the first, uh, so the, they have to watch all the videos before Tuesday, and then the first part of Tuesday is usually answering questions about the lectures. So they always, you know, those ones that they wish they could have raised their hand and asked, but, but didn't. Thanks. Quick question from online, from Michael Turin. If you could have made the course more hypertextish, maybe Coursera, Coursera limits what allows you, or more time, would you have done so? Um, yeah, so, so, so if I could have made it more hypertextish, uh, I think I know what that, that question meant, and I, you probably don't remember, you and I talked about this when I was first thinking about trying to do this class, um, which was my, my, my grand vision, which didn't happen, but which is that you could imagine um, that the class is at a pretty high level and there are things that some people don't know and I could imagine that you could then, you know, click to get a supplemental lecture on how vapor pressure works and, and understand that before going back to thinking about the polar caps on Mars or click over here to understand more about orbital dynamics. Um, it's a great idea. <laughs> I would, I, I was, it was part of my original idea how I did it before I realized that, you know, uh, a 15 minute lecture took four hours of my life. Um, I, 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 was, I was naive as to how long it would take. And, I, and even, even with that, that was with a lot of help from Caltech's uh, academic media and technology, who I learned early on that a lot of that four hours was doing the re-editing, which I was not like, I don't know anything about editing. Um, and they quickly came in and said, we can do this for you, it'll save you. And that saved me a ton of time. Um, but it just, it took a lot of time, so I'm not, it's, it was not the Coursera limit that kept me from hyper-texting it. It was, it was my own sanity, mostly, that did it. But for your graduate class, you did do something a little bit like that. Remember that? No. What did I do? <laughs> so the graduate class, you recorded some material and provided material because graduate students are coming into planetary science from a wide variety oh, of so undergraduate actually, majors. My second, my other class. So yeah, I teach, your other so class. Actually, I never even mentioned this. I teach two classes. I teach just one that's physics for Earth scientists, GE 108 it's called, um, which is really just a math, math and physics class. In many ways, um, I always wanted to teach non-scientists. That's my, uh, something I really want to do. And, and geologists are the closest you can get to non-scientists around here, so it's, it's, <laughs> so it's pretty good. Um, so, but it's, but it's, it's the geology grad students who actually need to know some physics and math, and, and they often don't as they come into graduate school, and in many places, you would send your, your geology grad students maybe to sophomore level math, sophomore level physics. Imagine doing that here. Um, so we don't, so I teach kind of a, a conceptual basic math physics course for geologists. And it's all online. This is not a, a massive open online class because I don't think anybody would care. Um, but, I, but all the lectures are online and we have a different classroom with whiteboards all around the place. And all we do, the entire time, is problems. I, every day we walk in, I give them a problem and they work on the board again with all of them in different places. And I actually did this class before I did the other class as a warm-up to understand how to do the, the lecturing online. So it was kind of my test. But I, I like that class, the yeah. way it works a lot. That's a, it's a really good, good class that way. So uh, our time is unfortunately officially up. It's 5.01. I think we can probably continue the conversation informally, but let's thank Mike for everything. Thank you.